the issues I'd like to cover are, are the general challenges in the contemporary uh, UK environment when it comes to managing talent and organisations in general. Um, and look at what represents a legacy approach to managing, identifying and developing talent uh, and what uh, represents a contemporary approach. And look at the impact of personality on behaviour in the workplace and look at how we might mitigate the risks of derailment, which is a concept I'll focus on in some depth. So the kind of challenges that organisations face when it comes to managing their talent is that organisations are under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, there's a lot more transparency when it comes to talent management now. HR professionals are being tasked with doing more with less money available to them. Uh, we've seen particularly in financial services organisations the pressure to hire quickly and accurately, get good people in but get them in very quickly to fill gaps. Uh, there's, a, there's a tension continually between the vision for the organisation, the expressed values, but also what's rewarded in the organisation and they can often go off at a tangent to each other. We frequently, frequently see the unintended consequences of high potential labels in organisations. Top talent is identified, they're told they're high potential and then they behave differently as a result and not always in positive ways. And in summary, there's an awful lot of pressure on HR professionals and it's one of the specific questions we sought to address in the research that I'm going to uh, relate to you now. Legacy approaches to talent management, um, a number of you in, in the room may have been through processes like this, characterized by subjectivity or, or what I call the shiny shoes syndrome, where someone thinks I can spot talent when it comes in the door, he's just the right kind of guy, I liked his suit, he had shiny shoes, as opposed to do they have the ability, the competence, the attitude to perform well, are they a good cultural fit, do they have the requisite skills and technical knowledge. Uh, a, a legacy approach over relies on chats or unstructured interviews conducted by people who aren't trained to conduct interviews where references and reputation still hold sway over more objective methods like putting someone through an assessment centre for example. Um, and this is ironic because it's more likely to happen at senior levels than it is at the graduate level. Graduates go through boot camp to get into organisations, senior appointments are often made with far less scrutiny and prior experience is emphasised over what can you do right now. And when it comes to development in organisations, we still see the risk of a sheep dip approach. Uh, an entire cohort of managers have reached a level, they're all put through the same programme, regardless of their individual development needs, which is inefficient and more, more so expensive. So, we'll talk a little bit about personality in the workplace, but first of all, what do I mean by personality? Um, from a psychologist's perspective, and to simplify it, your personality is your perspective on the world, how you see things and how you like to be. Uh, again, a number of you will have completed personality questionnaires over the years, um, and they'll have been for different reasons. To get into an organization as part of a development program, as part of your own coaching, but all of these speak to the same things. Do you like to orientate towards other people and work cooperatively? Do you like to work by yourself? Do you like to focus and work in a methodical and conscientious way or are you more spontaneous and so on. It's not the same as your behaviour because we can all work outside our comfort zone but we know when we're doing it. Someone who's a very introverted personality can present very well but at the end of that presentation they, they will have felt like they've done an awful lot of work. But personality does predict performance and it predicts behaviour to a certain extent so it is useful to understand what personality looks like in the workplace. So what I'm going to talk about is a sample of over 5,000 professionals working in financial services in the UK who completed Talent Q's questionnaire called Dimensions. And this is a, a personality questionnaire designed for the workplace about you at work. So how do you like to operate in the workplace? And what we saw were some interesting differences compared to our benchmark data along some of the personality traits. But we also divided this data set into those that operated in a technical capacity in financial services and those that operated in an HR capacity within the same organizations and there we saw even more stark differences that helped us understand sometimes the miscommunication that goes on in, in organizations between HR who in a sense guard standards and the line who want to get things done. 
Um, and these have implications for development needs of professionals in this sector, but also the HR professionals as well. So I'll, I'll point to both of those. So I'm, I'm going to refer to a banker sample, and that includes an awful lot of different people working in different roles. But effectively, they were all from within financial services, performing technical uh, financial services roles. When we compare them to our norm group, here in the UK, we found that they were much more communicative. They liked working with other people as opposed to working by themselves and communicating openly. We found that they were much more influencing, which is a nice way of saying that the default position is I'm in charge and I like convincing people of my perspective. And they were much more socially confident. They weren't phased by public speaking, uh, networking, meeting new people for the first time. They were significantly more analytical. They liked to base their decisions on data. They, liked, they were comfortable using data, and they sought data. And they were significantly more methodical, planful, and conscientious, feeling that it's important to follow through, keep your promises, deliver on time. These are strengths, but it's important to understand from a personality perspective that every strength represents a double-edged sword if it's overplayed. And that's where we talk about the concept of derailment. If we over-rely on key strengths, we run the risk of them coming back to bite us. So with the same data, we looked for potential derailers, and we saw these in terms of exhibitionism, which is being, um, uh, being drawn to the limelight and talking a big talk, overconfidence in reaching targets, making promises that you're not able to keep, and micromanagement, which is focusing on process and detail without the wider context being important. Now these represent derailment risks, which is not the same as someone derailing due to them, but they represent the risk of someone having a negative experience in the workplace because these can be rewarded in the workplace. So consider the individual who is middle management and is a great administrator in the true sense of the word. They follow the processes, they follow the letter of the law. They get told they're really good at that and they get rewarded so they do more of it. When the time comes for them to take a step up into a leadership position, the message is you need to step back from that detail and be more strategic in your thinking. That's difficult for them. It's a change around them and many people find that step difficult because they're no longer doing what they've been rewarded to, to do or what they enjoy doing. And that's the nub of derailment. So when we compare the banker sample to our, to our standard benchmark group, you can see that they're significantly more uh, communicative there. A lot of these other personality traits, not as significantly different, but they were surprising to us um, because we don't tend to see large differences at the sector level because assessments like this are designed to uh, not look for group differences, but to compare individuals against a profile, for example. And the derailment risks, well, actually, hypersensitivity is uh, seeing threats where there are no threats and being oversensitive to context, this sample were more likely to be uh, insensitive to the context. Uh, we found that they were uh, less likely to isolate themselves, actually, when under pressure. Um, they were less likely to be eccentric or over-rely on innovation, but do what's worked well before. Um, and iconoclasm is, is an interesting derailer in itself because it focuses on forcefulness to get things done and potentially breaking rules in order to shake things up. But we did see far more exhibitionism, a risk of overconfidence, and risk of, of micromanagement. Now, if we want to talk about managing the risk of derailment, obviously not all 5,000 people in this sample have derailed, lost their jobs, whatever that, that final consequence might be. But it's important to remember that derailment doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's a function of obviously the personality the individual brings to the table, but also the organizational message and what behaviors are rewarded and actually other people. So a classic example of derailment is where someone's tasked with shaking up a team, turning performance around. And if that involves breaking a few eggs to make the omelet, that's fine. Now, someone enjoys that, they get rewarded for that, until the day that they get hauled in front of HR and they're told, actually, you've been accused of bullying someone. Now, to them, that individual, that's a surprise because up till very recently, they were rewarded for that behavior, but the environment around them has changed. Consider individuals who are rewarded for taking risks, and suddenly, the message is, no risk. That's a sea change, and that's quite difficult for some people to adapt to. So we can't place the blame squarely on individuals, there's also the message that comes from the organization. Similarly, if you meet your KPIs, it doesn't matter how many people 
are left complaining about you or potentially in tears at the end of the day. We'll turn a blind eye to that because the KPIs are what's important here. So organizations can actually facilitate and uh, lead to derailment in their employees by ignoring behavioral issues, if performance in inverted commas is excellent or is achieving a goal for the organization, uh, if they only focus on the development of a subset of, of what's important, if they're not aware of the other personality traits or don't want to address them. As I said, uh, rewarding KPIs but not the, what are called sometimes softer issues, the interpersonal issues that can cause problems. Or indeed waiting too late before intervening at all. The individual, remember in all of this, might be blind or oblivious to the problems they're causing because no one's stepping in. They might be seen as an asset to the organization. They might be very high performing and technically brilliant, but they're causing problems with other people or they're exposing their organization to risk. Can you have too much of a good thing when it comes to personality? Well, I think I've answered that question. Yes, you can. And the problem with organizations is they often clone. They seek to recruit people like the people they have, believing that will give them similar positive results, not thinking about the negative that might come with that. And many organizations use what we call a threshold approach when they select employees. They want people who are as analytical as most people or more. They want people who are methodical as, as the general population or more than, that's fine. And that means once they're past the threshold, they're view, viewed as good. What this doesn't take account of, if you're, if you're not being mindful about it, is you're forgetting about the upper limits of each of these personality traits. And you run the risk of bringing in what we might call extreme personalities. And that sows the seeds for people who are too analytical, too confident, too influencing, and so on. So we talk about the difference between career limiters and career derailers. Um, and the double-edged sword of these strengths. Um, at one end, you've got career limiters, and there's no strengths associated with these, really. They're clusters of behaviors that organizations don't really reward. And such, they'll slow down your career progression. But at the other end, you've got the derailers that are positively rewarded because they have strengths and positives associated with them, but overplayed, they can lead to derailment. And what does derailment look like? It might be exit from the organization. It might be a poor well-being result for the individual. It might be chaos at the team level. But regardless, it's, a, it's a, an end point we want to avoid. And our model at Talent Q of the, the derailers and these risks, I'm summarizing here. I'm going to focus on a couple of these. We haven't got time to go through all eight, although I'm happy to afterwards if you'd like to. But the kinds of things that we see when taken to extremes, um, forcefulness and rule breaking and feeling the rules don't apply to you, that's when someone appears as an iconoclast in the organization. Uh, overconfidence, we, we've touched on. Eccentricity is over-reliance on innovation and new solutions rather than thinking what's worked before and then not being open to the feedback you get with your new ideas. But innovation is good, isn't it? Yes, in moderation. Focus on the task and getting things right is good, absolutely, but in moderation and where appropriate. And the point being that personality is on a continuum. We don't look to categorize people. So for example, if you wanted to hire the people in the green zone here, you're looking for social confidence, charisma, people being open with their feelings and their emotions, active, getting things done, great. But without thinking about the extremes, you might get the people who crave the limelight and do what it takes to stay in the limelight, which is the unintended consequence of saying, we need very socially confident people. Yeah. Hypersensitivity, well, what's looked for is people who are shrewd, people who see beyond what's obvious. Now, the left-hand side of this represents the career limiter of not being shrewd enough. The example I share with people, and it shouldn't reference anyone in the room right now, because I know there's a couple, but is the new graduate entrant into an organization who receives an email from the CEO saying, welcome aboard. If there's anything I can do to help at any point, just email me, and they do. And the CEO didn't mean that. They really didn't. And you took the CEO at his or her word. That's being too, too trusting and not seeing beyond what's obvious. Taking to extremes, it's seeing threat where there's no threat. Being obsessed with what did they really mean by, in that email? Or what are they saying over there? I can't hear them. I'm sure they're talking about me. So the flip side. But the overconfidence one is really interesting. Because we look for people who have self-belief and can get on with things. We look for people who have a competitive edge and have a robust and positive self-concept. They don't need babying. We want them to be 
out there getting things done, taken to extremes that turns into arrogance and believing you can do it, uh, where your confidence exceeds your competence. Uh, if this building, which it's not, went on fire and the fire brigade turned up, the overconfident person would guide everyone out, but then start telling the fire brigade what to do. They were outside of the, com the, you know, the right context, but they still had the belief, I'm in charge. This lack of self-awareness, lack of awareness of own limitations, the needs to win and beat others, this overconfidence was one of the major derailment risks we saw in our sample. If we, that comes back to the cloning piece. If there's not a diversity of approach, then there's the risk of groupthink, and that doesn't always work out for the best. So what can we do to manage this risk? Well, we need to be open and acknowledge the downside of what we view as strengths. Absolutely. We need to keep an eye out for the profiles that we're using to select against. It might not always be a good idea to say what worked five years ago will work now for the next five years. And to align that against the strategy of where the business is heading and what will we need for the future. So our future focus is really key. We need to really look at the kind of exercises we make people complete when they enter our organization. Are they actually reinforcing competitive and exhibitionist behavior? Or are they giving us a real insight into how people will behave when they're brought on board? And the thing that we emphasize as psychologists is to use data to make decisions and data to uh, create profiles of what good looks like in the organization, moving away from uh, idealistic caricatures of people and saying, well, actually, what two high performers in this organization, rounded high performers, what do they look like? Maybe we should get some more of them. So the implications here that we really need more objectivity in both the identification and development of talent, really using objective methodologies to pinpoint great people, but also acknowledge that there's a double-edged sword to their strengths from the beginning. We need to mitigate these derailment risks and acknowledge the limitations of some of the strengths that are being rewarded, whether explicitly or implicitly, in the organizations here. Key is a, an alignment of the vision and the values of the organization with what is being rewarded and encouraged at the individual level. If the value is to cooperate and be pro-social, but your bonus is based on sales, sales are going to win. That's the key thing. We need to have a more rounded focus on development needs and not just the technical side of things, but the interpersonal skills that make professionals effective. We need to include more valuation in this to have data to support return on investment calculations. Mentioning ROI to many HR professionals brings them out in hives because they believe that you can't do that with people. Well, you can and we do, and it gets them great respect with their senior stakeholders to be able to present a picture of ROI on development and recruitment and other talent management uh, contexts. And we really need to upscale HR practitioners in this space to be more robust, to be more business focused, to talk the language of banking, and to gain the respect of their internal stakeholders so they can positively influence talent management.